Armed with massive guns and thick armor, it seemed unstoppable, but just days into its first mission, the legend began to crack. Beneath the steel and firepower, the Bismarck had fatal flaws. Bismarck suffers from the same problems as a lot of German equipment from the Second World War. If you look at the basic headline statistics, things like armor thicknesses and armament, it seems impressive. However, a more detailed look at it shows serious problems. This is combined with a half century of historiography that has, for various reasons, romanticized and exaggerated German capabilities and technology to produce a skewed view of the ship. Bismarck's armor protection is a good example of this. It had a relatively thin 12.5 inch or 320 mm armor belt. This was backed up by a 4.3 inch or 110 mm sloping armor deck, protecting the key internal spaces like magazines and engine rooms. Horizontal protection was provided by two armor decks, a 2 inch or 50 main deck and a 3 inch or 80 mm armor deck, rising to 3.7 inch that is 95 mm over the magazines. This was designed for close range engagements aiming to keep shells out of the ship's vitals. It seems to have done this job quite effectively during the final battle, with the vast majority of Bismarck's survivors coming from those vital spaces. However, a closer examination reveals significant flaws. Enabled by technologies like aerial spotting, better shells, improved fire control computers, and longer baseline rangefinders, naval warfare had moved towards longer-ranged combat. Bismarck's armor scheme, with its thinner armor decks, was poorly suited to this. Long-range plunging fire could easily reach magazines or machinery spaces, doing significant damage, even at closer ranges. The armor scheme had flaws. The thin belt could not keep shells out of the ship. Shells that penetrated it might not reach the ship's vitals, but created dangerous flooding paths. There was poor armor protection for the portion of the crew who had to work outside the vital spaces or turrets, leading to heavy casualties in these areas. The armor belt did not extend deep below the waterline, allowing shells that fell slightly short to do significant damage. The armament had similar ups and downs. The main armament was eight 15-inch or 380 mm guns in four twin turrets. In theory, these 15-inch guns were excellent. They had a rapid rate of fire, with a theoretical loading cycle of 26 seconds, slightly faster than most contemporary guns. However, in practice, the rate of fire was much slower. The loading cycle represents the time taken to open the breach, ram a new round and charge, close the breach and fire, as the guns could only be loaded at elevations up to 2.5 degrees. When firing at any real range, time would have to be taken to lower the guns to this angle and then elevate them to the firing elevation, slowing the rate of fire. The rate of fire also assumed a constant supply of shells and charges from the magazines and shell rooms. This was not necessarily the case. During Bismarck's trials, major design faults with the hoists became apparent, resulting in two long interruptions to ammunition supply to the turrets. While these were rectified, the problems seemed to have lingered somewhat. At Denmark Strait, Bismarck fired less than one round per gun per minute. Additionally, the choice of four twin turrets was an inefficient use of weight, compared to the more common use of three triple turrets. The fire control system was generally good and included an early use of radar for fire control. While this could have been effective, it was poorly sighted. The exposed radar antennae proved highly vulnerable to blast and shock from the main battery.